How do you make a show about high school girls drinking tea and being in a rock band a monolithic piece of entertainment? The short but perfect answer to this question would be passion. It's not often that a piece of entertainment can fluster you with a plethora of emotion, but when it does, it's like no other feeling in the world. Just being personally connected to characters, a story, or its message is an unsaid love letter to that piece and its creator. For me, that earth shattering piece of entertainment was the 2009 anime production K On. This particular show manages to weave a masterful quality of storytelling through the advent of mere high school girls and has forever changed the way I can personally view media for all of its good and all of its bad. The crux of the show revolves around five main girls whose personalities establish some of the most creative dichotomy and chemistry in the medium. But most interestingly, the main cast centers around these five girls from which various female experiences can be related through male eyes. These specific childlike and whimsical situations that the show creates makes it enjoyable for even grown men. The strategy of the show revolves around how incorporated the viewer can become with the main cast of the show, set in a Japanese all-girls school. Strangely enough, the target demographic for this show was originally slated to be for otaku, generally styled as geeks or nerds. Otaku are pictured in Japan's collective imagination as socially maladjusted young men dressed unstylishly. Through that knowledge alone, the interest behind the show becomes a lot more validated, especially to understand why males connect to the show a lot more than women do. k is a seemingly straightforward piece of entertainment, but delves deep into the role dynamics of high school females, portrays the all-female environment with a compelling analysis on femininity, demonstrates how such a show can connect so greatly to a seemingly unlikely audience, and even why your identity shouldn't limit the impact of your voice. Japanese media tends to be a bit exaggerative with its writing, especially when it comes to characters. Western trends usually follow the hero's journey formula to writing characters, but Eastern media tends to follow more unrealistic tendencies. The unrealistic moments usually come in the form of interactions between characters. The introductory character, Yui, is a bit too upfront and weirdly charismatic with total strangers, which when watching for the first time seems a bit strange. Through the course of the series, this idea is expanded on, but she doesn't change too greatly, and that's the point. Yui is representative of a certain archetype, as are all the members of this show. She is a bit clumsy, dull, and lazy. Her dialogue is always centered around her being this type of person. At the beginning of the series, Yui can easily be definable along these terms. In fact, one might even come to the realization that she represents everything a woman should strive not to be in Japanese culture. Her incompetence to problem-solve, remember basic information, and be a functioning high school student is mostly substituted with cuteness, friendship, and being an annoyance. What strikes a balance is the fact that she attends an all-female school, which means there are no real patriarchal standards to uphold or oblige other than what her teachers instruct her to do. Japan isn't like the United States and instead operates off a very gender role-based society in which women are not entitled to much beyond motherhood. This was the common idea in Japanese culture from about World War II to about the late 2010s when women started to gain traction in the workforce. But even today, women are still referred to in archaic means, compared to Western commonalities. Wives refer to their husbands as shujin, meaning housemaster, and husbands refer to their wives as kanai, meaning one who remains inside the home. The reason Kaon was quite revolutionary for its period is partly because of this reason. Its characters, especially the lazy and unproductive Yui, was an anomaly to how traditional Japanese girls were set to be prepared for the future. To a Western audience, it would seem natural for a girl to be able to carry herself in any fashion she would desire, but in Eastern culture, this type of behavior can only be normalized through fiction. The academic environment is meant to nurture knowledge and learning through study to prepare the next generation of people to operate in society. k o n takes this idea and puts his own spin on what that specifically means. The primary facet of this show is that it revolves around the idea of an all-girls school. And with that sentiment in mind, it builds several foundations to pose different challenges to what is known about this environment, one being that it nurtures freedom of expression, especially through the students of its premises. In one episode, Mio and Ritsu, two members of the main cast, are set to be in a class play, the classic Shakespearean tragedy of two star-crossed lovers. Through the episodes in which we see them learning to become their characters, the awkwardness of their roles consumes them. Most particularly, Mio, who is quite comically the best fit as Romeo, has trouble breaking from her very feminine qualities. Mio represents the straight man archetype, who is constantly trying to get the girls in her club back on task and trying her best to be a formal high school girl. 
Many characters in the show claim Mia would make a great wife, and is very proper, quite contradictory to the role she must play as the charismatic and well-spoken Romeo. Ritsu, on the other hand, who would play Juliet, is a tomboy at heart and embodies the power complex and mannerisms of a young man. Ritsu has the fondness for being loud and outrageous while still holding herself in a respectable manner when it matters. She is mostly a part of the comic relief ensemble of the cast, but was forced to play the quiet and reserved Capulet, also quite contradictory to her personality. Both individuals actually suggest they swap roles because it fits their personality much more, but in the end, Mio and Ritsu keep their roles and have to quell or enhance their femininity in order to fit the character. It would have been easy to swap roles, and in fact, no one would really care if they did. But, the point of their reluctance to swap roles in the end is because they felt strong enough to become more than their associated identity and advance beyond their female stereotype. Aside from larger events like a play, episode to episode moments play out in a similar fashion, some highlighting one certain character. Mugi, another member of the main cast, is an oblivious wealthy girl who wants to fit into the normal lifestyle among regular teenage girls around her age. To put in perspective the type of girl she represents, Mugi was absolutely amazed by her first visit to a fast food restaurant. Her first attempt at normalcy was to join the choir club, a more organized and uniform organization intended for that purpose. Through the pure chance of, the only instrument I can play is the keyboard, she instead is strangely put into the position as a keyboardist for the ragtag band that has zero direction and essentially no goal, and despite this, Mugi holds faith in the normal high school lifestyle she was seeking through this club. This complex develops into the eventual tea time breaks between band practice and props her up to be a metaphorical homemaker. Serving tea and sweets with a proper smile to her bandmates becomes a staple and a natural flow of events in the series and the way it's portrayed, the show intentionally never holds bad connotations for that label. The irony in this reality is that they all reside in a rock band, a typically male-associated pastime, and willingly choose to engage in a largely female-associated activity. Although she doesn't play a large role as some of the other characters do, her presence is nonetheless an irreplaceable factor in the club and provides a lot of unintentionally comical dialogue. The emotional payoff of this show can be attributed to a plethora of ideas littered throughout the show, but the ideal and easiest to grasp is the character chemistry and its relation to the audience. Before delving into that, knowledge of the production behind k is a critical facet to why this show operates in certain ways. Kyoto Animation, the studio that produced this show, is famous for its progressive views on women. Its founder, Yoko Hata, assisted by her husband at the time, founded the studio in 1981 when views on women in the industry were far and wide frowned upon. Hata had a philosophical opposition to business practices in Japan, which forced people to live on unlivable wages and be overworked. Therefore, she built her company based on the idea of communication, education, and full-time employment, a significant percentage of whom were women. Years later, the same sentiment was held through all of their productions, including k -On. Although Kyoto Animation makes works for otaku, their works are heavily inspired and impassioned by their code of excellence, which applies to all people. This in mind, it's fairly easy to understand why this show, in particular, is revered in Japanese culture, so ingrained that its characters even appear plastered onto bullet trains. The five main characters of this show are just so interconnected with the viewer that the connection built reaches unbelievable emotional investment. Most viewers enjoy the show for its comedic stupidity that usually ends up with Mio smacking one of the characters on the head for saying stupid lines like, the air conditioner will let us perform cool songs. But what is laid as groundwork for female-centric gags will captivate even male viewers to learn to become a high school girl, metaphorically. Slapstick comedy is a rather simple but effective way that Kaon eases its way into the back of one's mind, because as time goes, the authenticity and natural flow of events becomes predictable yet still comedic. The hardest thing to understand for Western audiences is how a show about high school girls drinking tea and playing music is enjoyable for men older than 18. To that extent, this factor can be explained by knowing otaku culture in general. Otaku are fiends for quality products relating to certain niches, and what Kaon provides is exactly that. It fills a large number of grounds, that being emotions, comedy, relationships, and even music, but these genres are common in popularity amongst both genders, so why wouldn't female otaku be the more prevalent base? In the reality of the culture, women seem to be more frugal in their obsession, men are more emotional and simply are more picky about what they want. Although there is a young female audience, males are the predominant fanbase for this show. The stark difference is simply that women desire tangibility to their entertainment and men are more idealistic and fantastical in their media consumption. Therefore, the male fanbase behind k is reasonably justified yet still interesting to explore. 
Kaon encapsulates everything entertainment should strive to accomplish. Many series today are stuck in the fruitless repetition of previous work to achieve success, and what lacks in today's market is originality. And with a lack of creativity in storytelling or character depth comes the idea of self-insertion. That idea comes to fruition, but in a positive light, with the introduction of the final main member of the cast, Azusa, who joins near the end of the first season. The issue with self-insertion in most fiction-based entertainment is that many fail to expand on the character after creating the connection to the viewer, and hence, stagnation occurs, losing that initial intention. The difference between blatant and subtle self-insert is class. Does the show itself respect this type of character and therefore respect you? After learning and watching the dynamics of the four main girls for the first season, it was only natural that a new face would be needed to advance the group past just the same old routine. Azusa is her own character with different attributes that define her on the outside, but in the beginning we see that she lacks a solidified identity on the inside and substitutes that by attempting to be serious. As a freshman among juniors, she retains an outsider presence that eventually evolves into assimilation which is exactly how the viewer feels as the show progresses right along with her. After her introduction, she even becomes a focal point of perspective for the viewer and takes up more screen time than even the primary members. And quite similarly to how most viewers feel at the beginning of the show, Azusa felt distaste in the group because they lacked seriousness, but came to be enthralled by them through performance reinforcing that <laughs> In a poll asking individuals for their favorite k character, she appeared last on the rankings. Interestingly, it would only make sense for her to be last because she really is everything that symbolized resistance in the show's progression. Her personality revolved around being angry that the girls made no effort to practice their instruments and instead drink tea and fool around, which is the highlight of the show for many viewers. Since she essentially represents us, she actually holds no major association with either masculinity or femininity, so in turn, her serious nature is one of the single traits in the show not limited by any identity. Azusa is the voice of reason, but drowned out by the ultimate power of ignorance and bliss. The crux of what she provides as a character is the idea that your voice matters and not to be limited by your identity or circumstance to carry out such concerns, which is why Azusa never gives up on the possibility that her upperclassmen will one day see as she sees and practice their instruments for their own benefit. Ironically, she is seen constantly urging the girls to practice for their concerts but has no issue participating in the snack times prepared by Mugi, quite counterproductive to her purpose but pretty much how the viewer feels as well. A harbinger of productivity, but a flaker at heart. By the end of the series, when the four main girls are set to graduate high school, she comes to the realization that they're all really gonna leave, and that her club members were more precious to her than anything she had ever held dear before, despite how she thought and treated them. Out of all the members of the cast, Azusa is given the most cathartic and gut-wrenching conclusions, and for good reason. All of Azusa's emotions coincide perfectly with our feelings so heavily and captivatingly that even the most stoic of individuals will find themselves crying to the power of friendship and music. The problem with a lot of pieces of work like this is that its message and appeal are misunderstood. Naoko Yamada, the director of Kaon, actually operates on an alluring sentiment that shines throughout her work. Yamada acknowledges that femininity is often treated softly in cinema, but she also does not want to shy away from cuteness or femininity instead choosing to embrace it as a part of her artistic strengths. Yamada is a fiend for obscurity and focuses a lot on method directing because the minds of the individuals she uses are the most important asset of her work. To her, an emotional response isn't a construct limited to be feminine in nature, but a natural human response regardless of gender. For Yamada, her work is more than just consumable entertainment and she elicits the highest possible standards to make that a reality. The list of subtleties that shaped the show into the product that it became could go on forever, but for what it accomplishes, it's more than just a piece of media and has become a loving testimony to our faith in humanity and something irreplaceably beautiful. Hey, <laughs>